City led to a federal court decision to cancel the New York City elections but, or postpone the New York City elections. Could you talk about that? It, it, it's fascinating. What, um, what happened at that time, it was uh, the post-1980 census period in which uh, the, the districts were being uh, reapportioned in, in New York City and, and elsewhere in the country based on that census. And there'd been a dramatic growth in the Latino community in New York. But uh, the members of the city council drew lines that made it impossible for any new members to, to be elected. And as, in other words, it was a protection of incumbency, uh, but with clear racial impact. Uh, and uh, the board wholeheartedly uh, supported uh, my efforts to, to challenge those lines. And we devoted a great deal of time to it. Uh, we won a decision at the uh, district court level. Uh, went to the Court of Appeals, and finally, uh, the city tried to, to get us to the Supreme Court. That, um, and the Supreme Court ultimately, the day before the New York City elections in 1981, which included a, uh, a mayoral election, uh, issued an order and said they would not uh, intervene. And uh, that, in essence, stopped the, the election that year. That was a, a shot heard uh, around the world in terms of voting rights. And uh, I think it speaks to... Um, to her own commitment to, uh, she supported that action. She obviously is against racial gerrymandering now. Who isn't? Uh, but uh, she very clearly was, uh, was in a situation in which she encouraged uh, the program on which she served as a board of directors to challenge the government to ensure that the, the voting rights of Puerto Ricans were maintained. And it was not just Puerto Ricans. I guess there were a number of other minorities involved. Uh, in, in the race, including African Americans. Judge Sotomayor's uh, view on statehood or independence or commonwealth for Puerto Rico, do you know it? I, I don't know it. It's, it's something that, that we avoided discussing on our board because uh, there are so many facets and it's so volatile that uh, we've tried to stay away from that. Uh, and I have absolutely no idea what Judge Sotomayor's position is on the status of Puerto Rico. Commonwealth, do you know? about it either, but I have an indicia that I think the people of Puerto Rico should recognize at this point. In other words, her career, her whole judicial career and legal career has been in defense of the rights of Puerto Ricans, of the 8 million, the 4 million there and the 4 million here. So there is no doubt whatsoever that on what we call the status issue, we don't know what her position is. But when we know about the rights of Puerto Ricans, of all Puerto Ricans, those living here and those living there, she is uh, adamantly, as, as the name of the organization itself defines, <laughs> the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund. So her effort is to defend the rights of Puerto Ricans Whatever the status of Puerto Rico may be, a republic, a monarchy, a statehood, whatever the right, the, the, the status of Puerto Rico, she's going to be on the right side of the rights as defined by the Constitution of the United States. I'd like to uh, ask uh, uh, Tom uh, Goldstein, uh, on the issue of the, the most famous case that's often cited, President Obama cited it as well, the baseball case, uh, what exactly did uh, Judge Sotomayor do there? Judge Sotomayor called a halt to the strike that uh, threatened to disrupt or seriously wound baseball. This is when she was a trial judge, before she was a court of appeals judge. And she forced baseball to begin its operations again, uh, rather than uh, keeping the players off the field. And so it's really regarded as a, you know, a, a crucial uh, bit of baseball history because the game was in jeopardy. But when you say the strike, as as a uh, former uh, labor activist, <laughs> it was actually a an yes. owner's lockout, right, wasn't exactly, it, of the exactly. of the ball players. Right. So she was actually uh, stopping the owners from locking out the ball players. Exactly.
And also significant that she grew up right in the shadow of Yankee Stadium. She grew up in the public housing project. Just want to also mention um, uh, her parents came from Puerto Rico to New York, but her father died uh, at the age of nine. So she was raised by her mother, something that she brought up yesterday, honoring her mother uh, in the White House when she was nominated. Um, Marjorie Cohen, uh, the New York Times uh, quotes a lecture she gave in 2001 called A Latina Judge's Voice, where she said, my hope is I will take the good from my experiences and extrapolate them further into areas with which I am unfamiliar. I simply do not know exactly what the difference will be in my judging, but I accept there will be some based on my gender and my Latina heritage. Can you wrap up for us? Yes, judges certainly make decisions through the lens of their experience and, uh, and of their background. And the fact that she is a woman, the fact that she is a Latina, is going to invariably figure into her decision making and make her, I think, uh, perhaps more sensitive uh, than she might have been otherwise. And in terms of the composition of the court, you sound somewhat disappointed. The, uh, well, I'm, I'm thrilled that there will be the first Latina on the Supreme Court and that there will be another woman. But I really would have liked to have seen a, a uh, real progressive counterweight to radical rightists on the court, such as Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, and, um, and, and um, uh, Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, and why am I blanking? Um, Scalia, Thomas, Alito, and Roberts, four of them, yes. Um, I would have liked to have seen a, uh, an Erwin Chemerinsky, for example, or a Harold Coe, even though they're not women. Erwin Chemerinsky is a white male. But real giants in the area of um, constitutional rights, civil rights, human rights. Um, I am I'm very supportive of her nomination, and uh, she, she should be defended and she should be confirmed. But she is not going to be another Thurgood Marshall. Um, she will not leave an indelible mark on the court, ultimately, the way um, uh, Earl Warren did or, uh, or Oliver Wendell Holmes. I could be wrong about that. Um, I think that perhaps Obama missed an opportunity here, aside from all of the incredible qualities that she brings with her. But uh, hopefully, or hopefully, I guess, uh, one would say uh, he will have more opportunities to appoint justices. Well, we want to thank you all for being with us. Marjorie Cohn, President of the National Lawyers Guild, uh, professor at Thomas Jefferson Law School in San Diego. I uh, want to thank Juan Manuel Garcia Basalacqua, independent political analyst in Puerto Rico, knows Judge Sotomayor well, publishes a weekly column, is on radio as well. Tom Goldstein, attorney, founded the SCOTUS blog devoted to the Supreme Court. And thanks so much, uh, Cesar Perales, President and General Counsel of Latino Justice, formerly known as the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education. Fund. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We'd like to know your views as well. You can email us. Just go to our website. Also there, you can follow us on Twitter, and you can make suggestions for stories at stories at democracynow.org. We'll be back in a minute.